Nuttala. I'm a CFA charter holder and past president of CFA Society Finland. And I work as an associate director of manager research at Morningstar in London. I'll be moderating this session with Ricardo Rebonato today. Before introducing um, our speaker, um, a few housekeeping notes. So throughout this webinar, you can submit your questions via the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. So please don't use the chat for questions, use the Q&A button further to the left. You can also like other uh, people's questions and those with most likes will then float to the top. Uh, I will be moderating the questions and will prioritize the ones with the most likes and ask them from Ricardo after his speech. So to introduce Ricardo briefly, he is Professor of Finance at EDHEC Business School and has previously had academic positions at Imperial College London as well as Oxford University. Within asset management, he has been the global head of fixed income and FX research at PINCO, among other roles on the buy and sell sides. Ricardo has written, written multiple groundbreaking papers on factor investing in fixed income, um, which is a new and a bit overlooked field. And he is here to talk um, to us about factor investing in fixed income and why it and where it works and why it hasn't worked always as planned in recent times. So Ricardo, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you very much. And thank you for the presentation. I hope I can live up to the beautiful presentation I've had. And today I intend to talk about factor investing in fixed income markets. And the main point of my talk is to explain a bit the idea behind factor investing. We all know that factor investing is going through a torrid time and it's not going through a torrid time for good reasons. People have said, oh, this is the end of factor investing. What is happening? The factors are not working. So I'm trying to go a bit back to fundamentally say, when do we expect factor investing to work? Can we understand why it is not working now? And I am going to uh, point the finger to one particular culprit as to why all the signals that we normally use with factor investing are getting confused. And that signal is quantitative easing. And that disturbance is coming from quantitative easing. And then I will talk of the strategies that no longer work. And on a more positive note, I'll be talking to the strategies that still work. So, um, we all know that at the moment it is a difficult time for factor investing, particularly in fixed income. There are some general reasons that apply to all asset classes, and there are specific reasons to fixed income. And the important thing is to understand what, if anything, is still working. So what are the characteristics of a true factor? What do I mean by true factor? I don't mean by that an anomaly a strange effect, something that you can discover by uh, looking at the data and probably data mining, et cetera, et cetera. A true factor is a very clear economic reason and interpretation. You get a compensation for bearing certain types of risk when the security you're buying pays well in good states of the world when you don't need the money and pays badly when you, do, when you would need the money and it is this bad timing of the payoffs that gives rise to a true factor. Why, why is it important to look at it, to understand whether a factor is a true factor or not? Because a true factor does not disappear when you discover it. An anomaly disappears, the, I don't know, the, the end of months anomaly, the end of the, if we discover tomorrow the yellow stocks do better than stocks of other color. Well, there is no fundamental reason. And therefore, this anomaly, once discovered, it will go away. But a true factor is just the compensation for what I said before, the fact that there is a bad timing of a payoff. And therefore, and this is, so there is the good and the bad. Uh, the bad is that you get your nice payoff when you don't need it, and you get a bad payoff normally when you most need it. On the other hand, true factors, if they're really factors, are relatively stable. 
So um, the, there is no magic to true factors. If I know that the security will pay well in states of the world which, where I don't need the money and vice versa, I don't like the security very much. It is what I call a fair weather, a fair weather friend. And therefore, its price will go down because I, I won't bid for it. The price goes down, the return goes up. The extra return that is being gained by the fact that I don't like the security is the risk factor, is the risk premium. So the risk factor translates into a risk premium that is brought about by the fact that the price is lower than the security would have if it did not have this bad correlation. So true factor investing 101 simply means building portfolios with optimal exposure and diversification to the true factors. Okay, um, as we said, prices should reflect two things, expectations of future cash flows, what I expect a security to pay in the future, discounted in such a way as to take into account whether the, these cash flows occur in good and bad states of the world. Think of an illiquid security. An illiquid security gives you a, a pickup. It gives you a positive carry. But you know that in a moment of turmoil, that illiquid security will pay back. That is why the liquidity one to investive 201 for risk today is high high or low so we had the recognition of the timing of the cash flow but perhaps in periods of exuberance this and when and in particular, and this is the key, can I link the state dependent risk compensation to some variables that I can observe, or variables, for instance, being in a recession or in a period of expansion. Now, uh, this is the big problem. Doing factor investing 201 means being able to tell from signals from the yield curve, from asset prices, from past history, of whether today is a good time to take on the risk premium or not. However, quantitative easing has completely muddled up this signal. This is not in this talk, I'm not saying, oh, we shouldn't have done quantitative easing. There were excellent reasons why ex uh, quantitative easing have been done. And I'm just looking from the parochial perspective of somebody who is engaged in factor investing. For factor investing, quantitative easing is a disaster. To begin with, uh, what we teach our students is to say, uh, look, when it comes to financial assets, supply and demand doesn't really matter. Because if there is excess supply from irrational investors or excess demand, there are the smart investors to see that prices are going away from fundamentals and then they're brought back. It might take a while, there might be mini bubbles, etc. but this is what should happen. However, when the player is someone who can print money, everything goes out of the window. And the universal um, piece of wisdom on the trading floor, do not try to fight a central bank when the central bank has the ability to print money in order to put on the trade. So with pervasive QE, the price signals about the expectation of the future cash flows and about the magnitude and even the sign of a risk premium are totally corrupted. Let me just give for clarity, just a super simple example. Uh, this is a, a graph of the S&P 500, it stops a few days ago, and it goes all the way to the time before 
we even knew how to spell the word COVID. And I think you, we, we all agree that the pre-COVID world was a better world with better expectation for cash flows. And if I look at the level of S&P 500, I'm actually a bit above where I was in December 2019, before we knew about COVID. And arguably, when risk aversion should have been much lower. We are, we are facing unprecedented uh, uncertainty at the moment. Yet, the S&P 500 is higher than it was in December 2019. The only way to make sense of this level of S&P 500 is through the lens of Q&A. I don't mean that via Q&A, central banks have bought directly the S&P 500, but there is a ripple effect, a substitution effect, as they begin to buy first treasuries, then mortgage-backed securities, then high quality bonds, etc. the yields become more and more compressed. You can synthetically describe in a few words quantitative easing as the creation of controlled asset bubbles, with the hope, of course, that these asset bubbles will uh, deflate gracefully. Uh, we can look at the level of the 10-year treasury, 70 basis points, whatever, whatever it is today. We are in a period where governments are borrowing with, they are entering huge expenditures in order to support the economy in this long period. They will have to do taxation and or borrowing, huge borrowing is, is coming up. And typically you would expect in periods of high borrowing, well, yields will go up yields have come down. You cannot make a sense of any of this without quantitative easing. The level of yields today, moving specifically to uh, fixed income, cannot be reconciled with expectation and risk premium unless treasuries provide a near perfect hedge to consumption. The compensation for assuming duration factor risk is at the mercy of Q&A. So what does it mean? Whether I make money by being long duration, it doesn't really have anything much to do with my expectation of a future cash flow with risk premium. It just has to do a matter of guessing the aggressiveness of the future Q&E intervention with respect to the Q&E intervention, which is priced in at the moment. The slope signal has almost reversed. What was the slope signal? Since the 1990s, people have recognized academically in the 1990s with the work of Farmer, Bliss, Campbell and Schiller, that the more, the steeper the yield curve, the better time it was to go long duration. And the idea was, if the yield curve is very steep, is because the short end of the, the monetary actions of the short end of the yield curve have created the steep yield curve. This is because we are in a period of turmoil in a period of turmoil, people become risk averse and therefore the risk compensation becomes big. And historically, it has been very good to invest to be long duration when the yield curve was steep and to be short duration when the yield curve was inverted. Now, let's put ourselves in the same situation of turmoil that in the 1990s and early 2000s would have created a cutting of rate at the short end now, at the short end, we are virtually at zero. As we are virtually at zero, turmoil means Q, QE. QE means buying the long end, and therefore there is a flattening, not a steepening of the yield curve. So the slope signals have been virtually reversed. Um, other return predicting factor, such as the Sisla Povala, which is Cochrane Piazzese and Sisla Povala, propose different uh, uh, return predicting factor, more powerful than the slope. But Sisla Povala, for instance, depends on inflation indicators moving yields in a rational way. And this is out of the wind as well. So the next question is. Uh, what is still, is there anything that still works? And here I'm gonna make a distinction between long only strategies, long or short strategies, and long and short strategies. What is the distinction between two and three? With two, at any point in time, I'm either long or short duration, 
but I have is not a relative value trade. With number three, I am long and short at the same time, so it is a cross-sectional relative value leverage trade. Currently in fixed income, no pure long only strategy that I'm aware of currently work. There are still, and this is uh, uh, showcasing uh, uh, research that I've been doing with my colleague and the head of the Risk Institute at EDEC, Professor Lionel Martellini, on reversal and momentum in treasuries. I think we have done the first study using at QCIP level analysis of momentum. And for momentum strategies, we find that time series momentum, self momentum is profitable for look back and holding periods of nine to 12 months. Time series market momentum is also profitable roughly over the same horizon. Cross-sectional momentum. So time series momentum saying, if something has been a winner, buy it again. If something has been a loser, sell it. Cross-sectional momentum is look at each point in time, irrespective of whether the market as a whole has gone up or down, buy the relative winners and sell the relative losers. Cross-sectional momentum is not profitable. However, after adjusting by the notional, cross-sectional reversal strategy. So if at any point in time, this is for treasuries, it's a portion of the yield curve, the long end of the short end as one, over the six, nine and 12 months is more likely to underperform the section of the yield curve that uh, did poorly before. And these are the profit and losses. So the black line shows a market uh, long always strategy. The red line indicates a reversal strategy and the blue line, what I have, what I would have obtained with a momentum strategy. And another strategy that in fixed income does work at the moment, but it is a relative value strategy, is first defining value in treasuries. Defining value in bonds is uh, not an easy task. And people have approached this problem of extending the value concept, which is easy to understand it, to define in equities to fixed income in a variety of ways. Um, again, Lionel Martellini and myself, with uh, Jean-Michel Mezot, uh, we have published another series of papers looking at value in the following way. We have used what we call a, an affine model, an affine model which has an economic content. So this affine model is supposed to price all bonds correctly at a given point in time. Now, it doesn't do as good a job at fitting all the yield curve as your know, Nelson Seeger, your splines do. So actually the fit is a bit ropey, but that is good because we want to see discrepancies between where the, the yield should be of a particular bond and what it actually is. And we construct a strategy then of buying the cheap bonds, the ones who yield a lot and selling the ones that don't uh, buy high yield, sell low yields. The theoretical value is assessed using an economically justifiable Gaussian dynamic term structure model. And the next picture shows the profitability from this strategy, which is nice. Uh, but there is one thing that one should point out. Look at the period where this strategy makes a lot of money. And I have superimposed so the blue line of the rolling return from this long short strategy and the orangish line is my rolling standard deviation showing that the greatest opportunities are in periods again of turmoil that brings me back to the real factors that we were talking about at the beginning and the intuition is quite simple when it, there is a period of turmoil uh, the arbitrageurs that are supposed to make sure that the yield curve become, remains nice and smooth and fundamental value is respected, have other things to do rather than engaging in finessing the market in this way. 
So that is when there are opportunities. And for those people with sufficiently broad shoulders to take on the trades, uh, the trades can be very profitable exactly at this point in time. Which brings me with 15 seconds to spare to the conclusion of my talk. It is a difficult time for factor investing in general. Since quantitative easing is directly directed to fixed income, it is a particularly difficult time for factor investing in fixed income. And QE has become, in a way, a one-way street. We, every time there is a piece, uh, uh, some turmoil, QE comes in, rates are cut, they are not brought back to the normal level, then they are cut again, and QE is forced by the fact that at the short end, we are virtually at zero. And I have no idea what is going to happen when, well, in boons, we are already at sub-zero in 10 years, but there are limits to what, how QE can be affected. That is a very interesting and completely different talk. Here I'm focusing just on factor investing. I have tried to make the link between the troubles of factor investing and QE, Perhaps there is nothing else that we could have done, but that is a fact. There are still some strategies, if you look very carefully, but the strategies require being long and short at the same time. And to close using the uh, uh, expression that uh, by my previous boss, Bill Gross, it has become a bit of a job of trying to find the best looking horse in the soap factory. At the moment, all factors are under strain, something still provides something, some, some value, but you have to look very, very carefully to try to find the beauty of this horse in the soap factory. Thank you so much, uh, Ricardo. Um, uh, uh, super um, interesting uh, talk, which um, gives us uh, many topics, in fact, to, to continue uh, the discussion on. And we have some, some very um, interesting questions already here, and I wanted to put the most popular of, of them right um, to you. So the question goes, how long do you think QE will continue? It's been going on for about a decade. So is this the new normal investor just have to adjust to? Yes, yes, fantastically good question. If I knew the answer to that question, I would set up a hedge fund tomorrow. Um, <laughs> but it, in a way, central banks have painted themselves a bit in the corner especially because uh, I really don't, I don't want to criticize the job of central banks. Central banks have found themselves in incredibly different, difficult situations. However, the idea of the Greenspan put, of mopping up the trouble in financial markets with monetary intervention has become very much a one-way street. So in 2013, we were expecting rates to be normalized, to be brought back, it did not happen. If one look at the dot plots, at the blue dots that the Fed publishes every quarter, if you monitor them as said characters like me do since 2011, 2012, when they first were published, you see that the last blue dot, which is where the Fed expects Fed funds rate to be in the long term, has come down by 150 basis points. So what is, how do we get out of this situation? Uh, it is almost unthinkable. It, the, at the latest meeting in Jackson Hole, rise rates. Until we see actual relatively recently, it says when we see signs of reducing out good out that inflation might happen we're going to tighten rates now the new policy is different we want to see the white of the eye of the inflation before acting and in this situation how we get out of quantitative easing is a fantastically difficult question and to me the scarier question is um if it is a ratchet and it only goes one way, and typically surprises tend to be bad surprises, what are we going to do with the next and the next and the next crisis? Um, there is a limit 
even to Q&A. &E. I have no idea what this uh, will do, but I think we'll Q&A &E for a very long time. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. The, the voice is a little bit cracking, uh, but uh, but I, I I think we definitely got the. Um, the key points uh, from there. There is a, there is another question, which is may, maybe then to to explain uh, a bit more of the basics, but which is um, a pop, uh, a question that often uh, comes up, which is what is the functional difference between factor investing and smart beta strategies? Yes, uh, there is a bit of thing of terminology. Smart beta strategies. So many things have been put under this banner. You know. Uh, strategies becomes popular at one point in time. I tend to look at factor investing as exactly what I was saying before. There must be this link between I am compensated for the fact that I get paid in the wrong states of the world. Beta strategies are wider and beta strat strategies encompass, for instance, behavioral biases or um, institutional frictions. The fact is that for instance, institutional frictions can disappear at the stroke of a regulatory pen. So the regulation changes and oops, that disappears. Behavioral biases, I am always a tiny bit uh, uh, nervous because that implies that there isn't enough forthcoming hedge fund capital to iron them out. True factor investing doesn't disappear if you discover it. So the first factor ever before anybody spoke about smart beta or factor investing was a market factor. And the fact is that how the market does is positively correlated with consumption, with how well you do. So if you invest in the market, you, when the market goes well and you're rich, you're getting a lot of money. And when you are losing your job, the stock market goes down. So there is no way of avoiding this. So the fact that I tell you this, you say, ah, oh, right, now I know something. No, yes, you know something, but uh, you can't avoid it. So the distinction I make, I think that the smart beta is a wider, um, as a wider umbrella, and it takes in a number of other strategies, behavioral, institutional frictions, et cetera. One important thing has to be said, be extremely careful. At a deck, and this is not a plug for a deck, but at a deck, we are really, really super disciplined in saying we only call something a factor or a smart beta strategy if we can understand the rationale behind it, be it behavioral, institutional, or in asset pricing. Uh, data mining is so dangerous. If you look at a finer set of data, with the human ingenuity, and this is, this is the dark side of the not very good side of what has been some less scrupulous uh, actors in the smart beta area. You know, you, you squeeze this data, you torture this data until they talk, and they will talk in the end. And at the last count, justify factors. I say, well, you could have put a tiny bit more effort, you cover five more, you get one factor for every day of the year. But no, I don't believe there can exist 365 factors. There are probably 364, 360 data mining and five possible factors. Yeah, maybe maybe if just uh, if you allow on that. So so your recent research was on you know the the level of of the curve, uh, then the you know the, the slope of the curve, and then there was a, a paper on value investing and momentum investing. So yes. those are those yes. are the ones. So what next? Um, uh, what are the factors that you see elsewhere that you, you think might be, might, might have the qualities that, that you, you look for here? You know, in the case of fixed income, you have much less variety than in equities because I'm looking at uh, uh, non-corporates. That is the area where I'm focusing more. Uh, they are much more correlated. So, uh, in the case of equities, you can hope to identify a much greater variety of factors. Uh, quite frankly, in fixed income, I think that a, a handful of factor describes um, all the dynamics. There is liquidity, definitely. Uh, there is your duration exposure. 
and to some extent it is your slope exposure, then you go to a different dimension, but that's your really hedge fund land convexity trades. But those are very technical trades which are predicated on the curvature of the yield curve and saying, is at the very long end the curvature too pronounced or not pronounced enough given the level of volatility? But it is a different type of beast. This is, this is really a hedge fund type of trade. What I've been talking here is the type of trades where real, real money managers can engage it. Okay, okay. Um, you mentioned that you, your research is mostly on, on treasuries. There is a question from Mark Green from uh, PGGM uh, on credit, on factory investing within credit. Is, is that an area that you, you think could be a, a promising area? Um, is, 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 is that perhaps as, as, as impacted by, by QE as... Um, as it the, as is the definitely as impacted by QE. Absolutely, it's definitely by impacted by QE. Uh, credit is a good example of what I was saying before, uh, institutional constraints disappearing. We all know the strategy of the fallen angels. And the fact that's when uh, uh, certain corporate bonds approach the critical level of downgrade, they have to be sold by certain institutional investors, and therefore they are sold before and they lose in price, etc. Well, investors are not stupid. And there have been many, well, there have been two things. One, exploiting this anomaly, assuming the rigidity in the, in the institutional setup. But many pension funds and other holders of assets that says, well, we don't have to be stupid. We don't have to, <clears throat> excuse me, sell in this mechanical way. And therefore, to a large extent, the effect has gone away. Uh, credit clearly puts in a whole new dimension, which is, uh, you know, is, is the second part of a capital structure, which is therefore allows for greater richness and complexity than the yield curve. It has all the risk factors that come from the yield curve, obviously, but it also shares some of the... Uh, it is not my area of research. So I read papers on it, but I have not done uh, work myself. Okay, okay. So, um, yeah, so there's also a couple of questions related to, to, to equity factors, but, um, but perhaps we, we'll, we'll go into them later. So one question related to your paper on... Um, on momentum. So in your presentation, you said that long only strategies do not work anymore. But but in the momentum paper, you do mention long only strategies. So, you know, ah, could you explain what, yes, yeah, yes, what is the good, uh, very good. contradiction yes. here? Uh, uh, it seems to be a contradiction. Uh, the long only strategy of the momentum paper is the relative strategy in disguise. So what we have done, who has to have be invested across the curve. So that is my benchmark. Now I have an, so I'm long duration with no preference between the short end and the long end and I'm uniformly invested there. Now on this long only, I can create holes and I can, I lighten my position of a short end and I, increase my position at the long end, zero I have to go long and short. But if I start from a mandate, which tells me in your mandate, uh, be long duration throughout the yield curve, I can modulate these long duration without, uh, throughout the yield curve, remaining long everywhere, but embedding a slope position on top. So that is that's a very good question. So that is how to engineer a, a long short position remaining long as long as you have a mandate which is to say be long throughout. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Just to make, uh, the obvious equivalent in equities, you can be long the S and P five hundred, but then if you have relative views of I don't know. Uh, tech stocks against utilities without having to go long and short, you can lighten up on the high tech stocks and go longer in utilities and you create these uh, 
relative value position remaining long throughout. Okay. Okay, then uh, perhaps a bit more, a um, couple of questions related to implementation. So first of all, um, there's a, a question on how do you advise on shorting bonds due to their well-known and intrinsic limitations due to liquidity, etc. So with futures or, or, or what, what are the tools that you, you suggest? So because obviously your backtest in yeah. your papers include shorting as well. And I think you mentioned shorting futures there. Uh, I have actually, uh, we have done both. We have done both. Uh, in terms of liquidity, shorting futures is obviously uh, much more liquid. And that is, that is what we assume. In our papers we, all, papers, we always try to take into account realistic transaction costs. Clearly, uh, transaction costs are difficult to estimate. What we do is we put our, in our paper, we put the transaction costs proportional to the volatility in the market. So in periods of high volatility, our transaction costs balloon and in, in good periods, they become tighter. So all the results that you find in the papers that I'm very happy to share, I'm sure you'll be able to put some links to the papers if people are interested, there is always, uh, transaction costs are always included. No. Okay, and uh, there's also a question on are there are there any papers that cover in depth the implementation of different momentum strategies? Um, uh, in fixed income, uh, without sure blowing my sure. own without blowing my own trumpet, I can refer the readers to our papers. Uh, there isn't a lot of work, to my knowledge. The work we, the, we have published, uh, Jean-Michel Mezot, Lionel Martellini, and myself is the first momentum paper in treasuries at QCIP level. So we're the first ones, we have actually looked at individual um, securities. In the case of momentum, it is fantastically important because if you use, as many academics do, and, and I'm academic myself, so I'm not criticizing anybody, but um, discount bonds, virtual discount bonds, such as those created by the Fed, et cetera, they price the yield curve very accurately, but they have pricing errors. The pricing errors are correlated over time. So if one particular bond is cheap today, is also likely to be cheap tomorrow and the following day, simply because the pricing error is time correlated. Therefore, if you do an analysis using these virtual bonds, it looks like there is loads of money to be made. But in reality, what you're capturing there is the uh, serial correlation of the pricing errors, which are not real. So that is why it's absolutely crucial in fixed income to do momentum studies at QCIP level. If you use uh, virtual discount bonds, you hallucinate fantastic profits everywhere. That's where we started. We got extremely uh, excited. And, and then we realized it was, it was uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, uh, interesting. Um, just a couple of uh, couple of questions more. So <clears throat> one question um, uh, con uh, is around value. So could you comment a little bit more about the models used to identify value, I assume now in fixed income? So you mentioned that they have economic content. Yes. So yes, what indeed. are the drivers of this economic Thanks. content? Yes. The a fine model which I used are a let's say a translation of your Taylor rule, and that is attracted by reversion level. But this reversion level is not fixed; in turn, is attracted. By I, let me say the last blue dot. So you have the local reversion, le reversion level of a short rate was obviously very low because people knew that we're going to stay longer for a long period of time. So the reversion level instantaneous is low. However, people also thought at some point we're going to have a hike in rates and therefore the reversion level of the instantaneous reversion level is higher up. 
So this model is a translation, if you want, of uh, the Taylor rule that reflects the aggressive that tries to reversion levels to which the Fed fund rates are attracted over time. Uh, again, in the paper, it is quickly explained, and I really hate to do this, but you know, I can give you other references where the models is uh, explained in, in, in detail. Okay, okay. Okay, okay. So um, yeah, so we are, we are uh, coming um, to, to the end. Um, um, and um, so fixed income uh, factory investing, obviously um, uh, an area where, you know, there's there's plenty still 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 to research, and you mentioned some of the some of the areas where you also um, might might go um, yourself. Um, uh, uh, I mean, as a last question, um, um, do you see yourself that there is a danger that in fixed income um, we are we are starting to 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 um, uh, that researchers are are trying to come up with. Uh, really non-existent uh, uh, factors uh, the, as there's a lot of talk about the factor zoo on the on the equity side but on the on the fixed income side is is as as we've heard it's a, it's a fairly dis difficult situation already so do you fear um, that same phenomenon coming to the fixed income side um, as i said before i think in fixed income there is less room for a zoo to appear because of the high correlation between the movement of treasuries. So in a way, it is good news and bad news. It is, it seems to be bad news because, oh, we don't have as many factors, but the few factors that we have, when and if conditions are normalized, they can be simpler, more robust and informative. The dark side of this, the flip side of this coin is that I think it is a long way before monetary conditions are normalized. Okay. For the well, reason that we have discussed. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, uh, Ricardo. This has been an exceptionally uh, insightful session. Thank you. Thank session. you. And unfortunately, this is all the all the thank time. Thank you for the uh, questions uh, been... today. Yeah. Thank you, everybody, for your questions, um, uh, and obviously for Ricardo to to sharing your expertise. Um, after this session, um, you will all receive an email uh, with the recording of the webinar. Uh, we apologize uh, for some of the um, uh, issues with the. With the voice, but um, uh, but I hope that the majority really of of, of um, all the answers to the questions um, uh, came through, um, and there will also be a short survey uh, and a link to uh, um, upcoming webinars. Do give us your feedback; um, it helps uh, CFA Institute to make these sessions better, and we hope to see you at uh, future events. So enjoy your day wherever you are, and thank you very much. Thank you very much.